All right, revolution is not as simple as the bumper stickers, uh, you know, and the signs make it sound. Clichés, slogans for change. Revolution provides an opportunity, a battleground for anyone seeking transformation to jump into the mix. What happened with revolutionary change in Hungary during the 1950s is a great example that it's not so easy. People were struggling. The economy was in rough shape. That's where it always gets bad. After World War II, the Soviet Army occupied Hungary, and they were paying up to 22% of their national income on war reparations and ended up suffering historic levels of hyperinflation. Sound familiar? On top of this, taxes were extremely high, and citizens were forced to purchase state bonds. Those are high taxes and government mandating its citizens purchase something. If that sounds familiar, kind of like, um, oh, yeah, health care. That's right. Years of these policies, progressives uh, just don't want you to know, um, it caused all of this, caused all of this. Disposable income of the average citizen plummeted two-thirds of what it was in 1938. Wages to fall 22 percent, foreign debt to skyrocket, a shortage of goods, and eventually food rationing. Well, Stalin died in 1953. The Communist Party started to reform uh, themselves. They started to reform wing. Led by this guy. Oh, look at him. He's got the nice mustachio, eh? Um, largely unsuccessful, many staunch Stalinists were still in power and thwarted the reforms. He was undermined and removed from office in 1955. Struggling, starving, oppressed, angry. People are prime for revolution. The revolt began, where do you think, but with the students. They held forums on the problems facing Hungary and they steadily grew in popularity. Several student organizations began popping up, and by October 22nd, they had organized enough uh, to present a list of national policy demands. One day later, back in Hungary, a demonstration was organized and 20,000 people showed up. A manifesto was read to the crowd. I don't know if they chanted back. The crowd, which grew as the day went on, eventually over 100,000 people were there. But even with a manifesto and demands, things weren't as simple as one reporter from the Daily London or the uh, London Daily Paper found out as he described the scene on the ground. The rebels preferred the leader um, uh, Nagy, who was just uh, just a year earlier left office. He had been readmitted into the uh, Hungarian um, Communist Party, something that divided the protesters, and um, it almost came to blows. But the journalist explained that even though many students were anti-Soviet, anti-communism, quote, gigantic portraits of Lenin are being carried ahead of the marchers. What? The main body of students and marchers had already assembled outside their university in front of the monument to the poet patriot who led the 19, or 1848 revolution uh, and rebellion against the Austrians. Suddenly, a new group of students carrying red banners approached from a side street. Uh-oh, sounds like it could get tough. The banners showed them to be students of the Leninist Marxist Institute, which trains young teachers of communist ideology and supplies man puppet rulers, civil servants. The immediate reaction of the main body, I noticed, was to shout defiance and disapproval of the oncoming ideologues. But they were quickly hushed into silence, and the ideologists joined in the march with them, the rest of them, happily singing. Now, the end game was very, very different. They quickly realized that it, it didn't matter. Right here, right now. They both had the same goal, so they united. That's when trouble happens, when they unite. That's why they had to isolate the Tea Party. They couldn't. They couldn't allow us to unite, because once that happens, as it is happening now all over the world and here in America, it's over. It started out peacefully. Things went downhill rapidly. The government rejected their demands. Mark my words. Watch this history. After shouts of, out with the Russians, Nagy into the government, and death to Ragosi, the Hungarian communist politician, the protesters stormed Radio Budapest and tried to broadcast their demands. When their request was denied, all hell broke loose. Police cars were set on fire. Guns were taken from military facilities, handed out to the protesters. Fighting spread like wildfire. Revolutionary councils were formed all over the nation. They took over governmental authority and started destroying Stalinist communist symbols. Watch.
For five frantic days, Budapest is free, and our American cameraman is there to record Hungary's hour of hope and heartbreak. And our Russian hatred, smoldering for a decade, erupts without warning. The flames of liberty and revenge against tyranny leap high. A 16-year-old girl risks her life to remove the despised symbol of Russian enslavement. Throughout the city, Soviet war memorials come crashing down. Budapest is in revolt. With uncontrolled fury, crowds set fire to Russian flags and put Soviet books to the torch. The Red Star is sent tumbling into the gutter. Word comes of shooting on the other side of the city, and the rebels, armed now, run to the scene. A quiet park has become a no-man's land. Our cameraman is caught in the crossfire as rebel sharpshooters advancing across the square attack the headquarters of the Soviet-controlled secret police. The Hungarian patriots refuse to give ground before the withering fire from the building. They are showing the world that freedom is worth dying for. A tank moves up. Is it rebel or red? No one knows as its gun swings to point directly at our cameraman. It belongs to the rebels, and behind it, white-coated first aid men care for the wounded. And then turning on the Soviet stronghold, the tanks lead the final victorious assault. As the rebels storm the building, the impossible is happening. A handful of heroes has shaken the communist world to its foundations. They have turned the tables on their Soviet tormentors. The rebels ride their tanks triumphantly through the streets. The Russians have given their word that they will withdraw all communist troops from Hungarian soil. The victory seems complete. Cardinal Menzenti, who has suffered long persecution under the Reds, leads his countrymen in praying for an end to the fighting. The jubilant people of Budapest, flushed with the excitement of their historic struggle, surround our cameraman's car. They press closer, pleading, tell the world we are free, we have cast off our chains. Faces white, free of fear, tell the story of Hungary's hour of hope as our cameraman hurries these pictures to the Austrian border. Behind him, Russian tanks rumble back into Budapest to turn that hope into heartbreak. 5,000 come with 200,000 Soviet troops to snuff out the torch that brave Budapest had held so high. Tears stream down the cheeks of grief-stricken refugees who must flee now for their lives. Loved ones, dead or captured, are left behind as Russia, without mercy or conscience, tries to wipe out the country that so grievously wounded it. The pathetic procession makes its way to the Austrian border. While far away, a rebel radio broadcasts a last agonized plea. On the watchtower of 1,000-year-old Hungary, the last flame begins to go out. The Soviet army is attempting to crush our troubled hearts. Listen to our call. Our ship is sinking. The light vanishes. The shadows grow darker. God be with you and us. November 4th, 12 days after Hungary, uh, after Hungary had the rebels rioting in the streets, the Soviet came thundering into Hungary with thousands of tanks and orders to destroy everything. If a shot rang out from a building, the entire building was coming down. The Soviets made little attempt to distinguish enemy from innocent. By 8 o'clock in the morning, they had taken over Hungary radio. Last words to be broadcast were these. Help. Help. is battered Budapest under the brutal Russian boot. Soviet tanks roam the streets amid the ruins they made as communist secret police hunt down heroic freedom fighters. Here for all the world to see is grim evidence of the brutality and savagery with which the red tanks blasted a defenseless people and their city. Two Budapest cameramen risked execution to make these pictures and smuggle them out of Hungary. 25,000 Hungarians are dead. Budapest is ravaged, but the communist masters cannot crush a proud people. Defiantly, they chant, we shall be free. Refusing to live under Soviet tyranny, refugees stream into Austria. They flee with little more than the clothes on their backs. At journey's end, they can smile again.
Border guards beckon the refugees on as they brave the quicksand of an icy quagmire. The Russians have blockaded highways and destroyed bridges in a desperate effort to halt the mass exodus. But in six weeks, 120,000 Hungarians slip out of their troubled homeland. Hungary's prime minister broadcast a radio announcement that the new government was still in place. Within hours, he was seeking asylum. He was captured shortly after, after and executed. Information on this revolution had been suppressed for nearly 30 years. Revolution, even against a real evil, is never easy. It is never as simple as change. There will always be a struggle within the struggle because the end goals are never the same.